Good morning. Thank you, uh, Laura and the team, for leading us in worship this morning. Uh, forgetfulness, I've already displayed a little bit of it this morning, and um, it can be a problem. It can be a real problem, and no one is immune to it. Um, we will forget. And I'm, I'm learning this more and more about myself, how prone I am <laughs> to forget. Um, research has shown that people forget things due to a failure in one of three mental processes. Acquisition, <coughs> storage, and retrieval. Or to put it another way, getting it in, keeping it there, and getting it out. I'm going to show you this little cartoon, and maybe some of you will resonate with this. This is the Forgetful Folk Support Group. <laughs> <laughs> I this one, this one really rings true for me. My memory's so bad, how bad is it? How bad is what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what we resonate, don't we? Forgetting to pick up the dry cleaning. That's inconvenient, right? Forgetting someone's name, that, that can be embarrassing. Forgetting the anniversary, that can be problematic. <laughs> but when we forget all that God has done for us, that is tragic. And God, knowing just how prone we are to forget him, and to forget all of his benefits, presents to us in his word the best weapon for fighting forgetfulness. And we're going to take a look at that in Psalm 103 that we read this morning. And you can turn in your Bibles there right now if you would like to, to Psalm 103, this great Psalm of David. I trust that as we look at this this morning, that it will serve as a fitting conclusion to our Summer in the Psalms series as it not only sums up a lot of the things that we've been talking about this summer, that we've been learning in our journey of the Psalms, but more importantly, it teaches us how not to forget the Lord and what he's done. This is a Psalm of David, most likely written in his later years. That's pretty clear. We, we know that from the great sense that he has here of the brevity, that the frailty and fragility of life but also the incredible gratitude he has for the forgiveness that is his, that God has shown him. And, uh, and so what we have here is an incredible psalm. This is what one commentator said about Psalm 103. More than a thousand pens could write, it is one of those all-comprehending scriptures, like a Bible in itself. And it might alone suffice for the hymn book of the church. Psalm 103. And David begins this psalm by doing something that we've seen him do before. He talks to himself. He gives his soul a pep talk. He's kind of like the coach to his soul here. He says, some of the psalms wrapping it up. He says, praise the Lord, O my soul. Soul, hey, soul, praise the Lord. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. He's preaching to his soul. We saw it a few weeks ago when we looked at Psalm 42. When he said, why are you downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. Here it's praise the Lord. The covenant name of God. Yahweh. Personal. Intimate. David's on good terms here with God, his personal Lord, and he's saying, praise him, the Lord, O oh, my soul. Nefesh is the word in Hebrew. It, it refers to the innermost being, the core of who we are, our heart, our soul, as he says here. It involves our will. It's our spirit. And he's talking to his soul, saying, this is what you got to do. you got to praise the Lord, O oh, my soul. See, he understood at this point in his life that, that praise to Yahweh doesn't come from our lips. It comes from our soul. It flows through our lips, but it comes from here. 
I like what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, soul music is the very soul of music. So, why? The question is, why? Why is David preaching to his soul to praise the Lord? Well, we see in the answer verse 2. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. There's a connection here between praising the Lord and not forgetting his benefits. And it's an important connection that I, I pray we will see today. Now, here's the thing. We're not just talking about a mem memory lapse. That's not what David exclusively has in mind, though that might be a part of it. That, that word forget in the Old Testament is used of God's people deliberately turning their backs on him. Intentionally forgetting the Lord. We see it in Deuteronomy 8 where they turn their backs to serve other gods. That's a deliberate act. And that's included in this command not to forget. How do we do that? By praising the Lord. You know, I was thinking about this this week, um, how prone we are to wander, right? We sing that great hymn, how prone we are to wander, to leave the God we love. I cringe, probably like many of you, when I, when I think back on all those I have known who used to walk with the Lord, but who have turned their backs deliberately, who have forgotten him now. And so in order not to forget, David commands his soul to praise. The way we fight against our tendency to forget the Lord and all his benefits is the deliberate activity of praise. This is what the great British evangelist and teacher G. Campbell Morgan said of Psalm 103 with regards to praise. He said this, Psalm 103 is perhaps the most perfect song of pure praise to be found in all of Scripture important what we're looking at then. And it's important we understand what that pure praise looks like and what it involves for us so that we do not forget the Lord and all his benefits. Now, when you hear that word praise, what do you think of? You might picture something like this. Here's what you do if you Google praise and worship. Okay, this is straight off of Google. Images like this. Right? We gotta do like this, right? These people are presumably singing, right? Hands lifted high, heads straight up to heaven, thanking God for all he has done. I assume. Again, we don't know. Only the Lord knows the heart, but that that it's image after image after image of this. I don't think that's what David has in mind here. It's, it's kind of not at all what he means when he says praise. See, there's a few different words in Hebrew for praise. Seven, in fact. And each one has a distinct meaning. And the word translated praise here is also translated probably in some of your versions as bless. Bless the Lord, right? Bless the Lord of my soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. It's a good translation, but the real meaning, what's behind bless, the literal meaning is kneel. The word's barak. Barak, which means to kneel as an act of submission and adoration. To, to kneel, to get down on your knees, face to the ground before the Lord. But here's the thing, it's, it's not simply a physical posture. In fact, what David is saying is, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. So not just praise the Lord, O oh my body, but praise the Lord, kneel, soul. My soul, you better kneel, soul. Submit to the Lord. Submit the will. Submit the heart. Submit the thoughts. Everything to the Lord. That's what he's saying here. So it's really not a picture of that at all. It's something more like this. Forget not all his benefits. And I want to 
tell you something about God's benefits. God's benefit plan is unlike any other. And that's what this psalm is all about. Remembering the Lord's divine benefits. How? By praising the Lord, our divine benefactor. It's a psalm about the benefits and the benefactor. And the benefit plan that the Lord has for us begins, verse 3, with this. Forgiveness. Bless the Lord. Kneel before the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all his benefits. It begins with forgiveness. Who forgives all your sins. Why does forgiveness leave the list? Because it has to. Because we cannot have fellowship with God or worship him as we ought unless... The issue of our sin has been dealt with. And because of the severity of David's sins, which were many, as we looked at in some detail three weeks ago when we looked at Psalm 51, he had come to know and experience God's forgiveness to arguably a greater degree than anybody else. And notice he connects the forgiveness of sins with the healing of diseases. Look what he says. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. This is an important point to understand. And an important point not to misunderstand. See, it's, it's important we see the relationship between disease and sin. And forgiveness and healing. Disease, sickness in these bodies is, is a product of sin. Not our individual sin. But the sinful state of humanity. After the fall in Genesis 3, that, that became a, a part of our existence. The fall meant that sickness, disease, death are now part of our life on earth. But God's plan wasn't finished, was it? At just the right time, God sent His one and only Son, Jesus, into the world. Not to eradicate disease and sickness immediately, not to explain it per se, but to fill it with his presence and to die on the cross in order to pay for that very sin that causes all of our sickness and disease. And then three days later, he rose from the dead, defeating death, victorious, securing the promise of our ultimate and perfect healing that we will experience in the resurrection. What a, what a glorious hope and promise that is. David wrote this psalm 1,000 years before the cross of Christ, and yet it takes Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. It takes that for every single one of these benefits, starting with forgiveness, to take full effect. Isaiah 53, 5. He Looking ahead to Christ, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. By the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are forgiven. No. By his wounds we are healed. See, it's interesting. When, when Jesus encounters the paralyzed man in Matthew 9, 6, he doesn't pronounce him healed, even though he heals him. He pronounces his sins forgiven. There's, there's an interesting and important relationship here. Can God heal us physically of any disease? Yes. I believe that absolutely he can. Should we pray for healing right now if we are someone we love are sick and suffering? Yes. We can and we should. Because God can do that. We know that. But is Psalm 103, 3, this verse here, a guarantee of perfect physical health and healing on earth? No. No, it's not. Any physical healing we experience in these bodies, and it does happen, it is real, I believe that, but it is at best temporary. Right? Every person Jesus healed eventually died. Got old, got sick, didn't they? Because again, these, these bodies, this is not where our hope lies. Walking around on this earth as we are right now, this, this is not where our hope lies. Our hope is what is 
not see, right? That is what hope and faith is. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain positive what we do not actually see. The resurrection. The resurrection. Now, there were eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection. Absolutely. That is real. That's how we know. And that word's been passed down and we have it now. And that is secure and that gives us that hope. That assures us of what we believe. Here's the thing. This is not a promise saying that the Lord will heal all your diseases. Instead, it's a proclamation that the Lord alone is able to forgive all your sins and to heal all your diseases. That's what it is. He alone is able. But whether or not he does right here, right now, that's, that's up to him. Who knows best? For those in Christ, it's only when we're free of these imperfect, broken bodies, when we're clothed with the immortality of our glorified bodies that we'll finally be free of pain and sickness that sin has caused. Finally free of, of cancer. Every disease you can think of. Free of, of mental deterioration. And we have that hope. And we can bank on it. It's a benefit, my friends, we must never, ever ignore it. And yet, you know, when we fail to do this, when we fail to bow the knee of our soul before the Lord to submit to Him, we can forget it. Especially because pain and suffering, man, they're real. And it hurts. And in the midst of that, we can forget, can't we, the Lord and all His benefits. May we not do that. May we submit to him and remember. David continues, praise the Lord who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Redemption. It's, uh, this word redeem points to this powerful Old, Old Testament picture of the kinsman redeemer. One who ensure the safety of a family member by purchasing their freedom from slavery. Now, if that's all that had happened for us, that would have been amazing. That would have been great. Had the debt of our sins simply been erased, wow, that would have been incredible. But here's the thing. We haven't just been forgiven and set free. We've been released from prison, not just back onto the streets, but directly ushered into the throne room of the king. That's the picture that David is painting here. Crowns you. Crowns you is what he says. He, he has crowned you with love and compassion. What an amazing picture. And yet again, somehow we're prone to forget it, aren't we? Why? Because we fail to praise, to bow before the Lord, bow our souls before him as we ought. Think about being crowned, coronation. That you have to bow down to have the crown placed on your head by the crowning authority, don't you? And when we fail to do that, it's like throwing his love and compassion in God's face, in a sense. Verse 5, we read the psalmist, he says, He redeems your life from the pit, crowns you with love and compassion, he satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. It's an amazing Amazing image, isn't it? Same one Isaiah uses in Isaiah 40, verse 31. I don't have it here. It's, they will soar, right? They, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. But let's be clear. This is not a promise that we get what we want. It says desire. We tend it all. God, hey, he'll give us what I desire. This is actually better translated, who satisfies your mouth, the desires of your mouth with good things. This is the picture of being fed. He gives us what we need. That's the picture. You can't always get what you want, but he gives us what we need because he alone knows what we need and what is best. And then we come to verses 6, 7, and 8. And, and this is an interesting passage of this, this passage because... Part of this passage story because right here, the Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate.
compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Does that sound familiar? Maybe it doesn't, maybe it does. Here's why if it does. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. The Lord passes in front of Moses, comes down in the cloud, passes in front of him and proclaims, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands of forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. This is after the incident on the mountain when Moses came down, when the, the tablets were smashed, when God's people were involved in every form of, of rebellion and debauchery, and yet God here, two chapters later, the Lord, the compassionate, gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. David quotes it. The Lord is compassionate. That word refers to the, the nurture of a mother's womb, that the safety of, of, of a mother's womb is what's in, in view here gives us a real glimpse into God's, God's heart for his children. And what flows out of, of that compassion is grace. Look at the word, is gracious. This term speaks of God's unmerited favor. That is, God in his grace gives to us what we do not deserve. That's a, a reasonable definition of grace. What do, not, do, what do we not deserve? All the blessings that he's talking about here. We don't deserve any of it. But he gives it to us in his grace. And then we see this. The Lord is slow to anger. This is a very vivid word picture in the Hebrew. It literally means being long of nostrils. It's not trying to say God's got a big nose and big nostrils. What it's saying is the nostrils flaring, that's a sign of anger. And God's nostrils take a long, long time to flare. Because he is slow to anger. He's, he's patient with us. Reminded of 2 Peter, right? The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Finally, the Lord is abounding in love. This is perhaps the most Powerful, precious Old Testament word. It's the word hesed. And it refers to God's loyal love. It, it involves a lot of ideas, including compassion and mercy, steadfast love. It's been translated, probably the best translation is loyal love. God is abounding in his loyal love. And notice David says, verse 9, he will not always accuse. He will not harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. I can't think of a better definition of mercy than that. Right here, verse 10, God's mercy. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Mercy is not receiving what we do deserve. So we talked about three weeks ago in Psalm 51 where David cries out, Have mercy on me, O God, in light of what I've done. Have mercy on me. That he knew that was his only hope. That was the only thing he could plead to God for was mercy. Do not give me what I deserve, please, Lord. If God treated us in proportion to our sin, we got a big problem. We'd all be hopeless, condemned to an eternity of suffering, torment, separation from God in hell. Because that's exactly what our sin has earned us. That's exactly what my sin has earned me. But in God's grace and mercy, which we cannot even understand fully, my friends, the difference between what we deserve and what we receive is immeasurable. Look at verse 11. You see, God forgives us in proportion to the dimension of his loyal love, his hesed. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. How high is that? Can we, can we get a measurement on that? 
No, we can't. That cannot be measured. And that's how high, how big, how great his abounding, loyal has said his love is for those who fear him. Wow. If God's love is measured by the distance Jesus traveled to die in our place on the cross, then it should be no surprise that the cross removes our sins an infinite distance away from us. Look at that next verse. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Wow. Again, immeasurable. What an amazing promise. And yet, when it comes to our sin, we kind of forget that, don't we? <laughs> All right, he's, he removes my sin from me. We, man, we get so down on ourselves, don't we? Because sin is sin. And Satan wants to use lies to trick us, to make us forget what we've been given, the benefit of the forgiveness that is ours in Jesus Christ, that, that he has separated that, that he has taken our sins away. That's what the Hebrew word means, to carry the sin away. You see, uh, we can doubt. And, and that's exactly what Satan wants us to do. He wants us to doubt God's promises. He wants us to doubt God's benefit plan here. He wants us to, to question God and, and doubt who God is, His character, His love, His grace and forgiveness. He offers us in Christ all of God's benefits. And Satan wants us to forget this, that as a father has compassion, again, that, that word, that nurture on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Our Heavenly Father is compassionate. He knows better than we know ourselves. He knows us. He knows the hairs on our head. <laughs> he knows the thoughts in our mind. He knows where we're going today and tomorrow and every day until the day we die. He knows us. He knows how brief our time on this earth really is. Verse 14, for he knows how we're formed. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it. It's gone. Its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. And his righteousness with their children's children. With those who keep his covenant and get this. And remember to obey his precepts. There it is again. Remember. It's a wonderful promise of God's mercy that extends not just to us, but to our children and their children as well if they fear the Lord. We dedicated Sean and Chelsea little, little ivory this morning to the Lord to set the example. Right? That's what we're doing. God has entrusted your children to you, our children to us, our grandchildren to us, to be faithful so that we can show them what it means to fear the Lord, what it means to bow the knees of our souls before Him in submission and adoration to Him every day. That is what praise is supposed to look like. That is what God requires. That is what is going to keep us from forgetting. Forgetting His benefits, forgetting His promises. Look at how David ends. I, I love how he ends this song. Kind of the same way he started. He begins the song by preaching to his soul to praise the Lord. And what does he do? He ends by preaching to the angels and all God's works to do the exact same thing, to praise the Lord, to kneel in submission and adoration before the Lord. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty, mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Paul echoes this in Philippians 2, doesn't he? That at the name of Jesus, 
every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That amazing doxology. You know, we sing that song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord, I want to see you. According to Psalm 103, I think we need to change those lyrics a bit. Bend the knees of my soul, Lord, so I can praise you, so I can bless you. People say, how do you bless the Lord? Bless the Lord. Well, God blesses. He's the blesser. How do we bless the Lord? We, we honor him. We submit to him. We kneel before him. Kneel if we can. Yeah, kneel like this, sure. But for those of us who can't, for those of us who can't get up, after we fall down on our knees, we kneel our souls before him, our wills before him. We submit to him to have his way today in my life. Have his will as it is in heaven. There may be some here today who have never submitted to the Lord, never bowed before him and confessed that you've sinned and fallen short of his glory, <laughs> that you need help, that you need the forgiveness that's found in Jesus Christ alone. Today I would invite you to do something that you've never done before. Praise him as you should. How? By kneeling before the Lord your God in repentance, submitting your heart and soul in humble confession and adoration to the Lord our God, our Maker. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. If you believe in your heart, yeah, that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. You will receive God's full benefit package. Redemption, forgiveness, satisfaction that is found in Jesus Christ alone. What about those of us who are in Christ? Some of us, that's what needs to happen today. We need to bend the knees of our souls in submission to him. Because you know what? We, we might not have been doing that too consistently for the last little while. We get into a habit, don't we? We get into our, our ways of doing life. But man, this, this submission that's in view here that David talks about, this Barak, that's something that has to happen every day. Every, every moment, if need be. Submitting to the Lord. I'm thinking of where we're at as a church here. We're, we're kind of at an important crossroads. We're not entirely certain of, of the path forward. Of, of what it's going to look like, what, what staffing will look like, what, what those decisions will entail. But I know this, this, this is how we need to approach it. Because God knows. We don't. So we submit to him and we worship and adore him as we do that, as we wait on the Lord like we sang. And he will renew our strength. And he will show us the way. And the Spirit will lead us forward exactly how we're supposed to go when we are fully submitting, surrendering our wills to the Lord. Getting on the knees of our souls before the Lord is the only way we'll get on our feet. So may we praise the Lord today, my friends, and remember all of His benefits by bending the knees of our souls in humble submission and adoration to our Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Praise your holy name. Amen. I'm just going to say uh, one more prayer here as the team comes up. And I'm just going to be asking here, if, if you are in that place this morning where you've never given your heart to Christ, you, you've never bowed before him in submission, I'm going to say a prayer as part of this closing prayer that, that you can say in your heart, Inviting Jesus to be the Lord of your life, bowing in submission before him today to receive the forgiveness that is found in Christ alone. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for this opportunity that we've had to open up your word. I thank you for it, God. I thank you for how you speak. I, I thank you for, for what we can understand here by your Holy Spirit. 
And I pray right now, Lord, for those who perhaps have understood something, maybe they've never been ready to, to receive before today. God, if, there, if there's anyone here who is at that place where they know they need to submit to you, they need to bow the knees of their souls and surrender to you and, and ask you to be the Lord of their lives so that they can live a life of praise, so that they can discover the meaning and purpose that you have given them, Father, the forgiveness that they need so desperately. I pray that they would ask you today, God, to come in, that they would accept by faith that full, amazing benefit package that we read about here in Psalm 103. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for forgiving us of our sins. Thank you for dying on the cross to save us, to pay the penalty for my sin in full. Thank you. Thank you, God, that you rose Jesus from the dead, that, that he is alive in heaven forevermore, triumphant, and that in that we have hope for the future, that we one day too will be raised to life through our faith in our risen Savior. Come into my heart. Have your way. I bow before you today. I repent of my sins and turn in faith to you, Lord Jesus. Father God, if there's anyone here who has prayed a prayer like that or is thinking on those words right now, Lord God, we, we praise your name for that. We thank you that there is rejoicing in heaven for every soul who turns in faith to Christ for forgiveness. Father God, I pray that as we continue on our week, as we go about this fall, that we would find ourselves every day on our knees, on our knees of our souls in submission to you.